Let's go to 163 at the cross. We're going to sing the first and the last verse. 163 at the cross. to 462, Blessed Assurance.
sing one more song. If you could turn to 428, we'll sing Sweet By and By, 428 in your hymnals. We'll sing the first and last verse. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you, Dick Lane. Everybody else, good morning and happy Sabbath. There we go. Awesome. All right, we'd be blessed to be in the Lord's house today, enjoying the liquid sunshine outside, right? It's good to see all of you here. I have a few announcements to make, but I would like to start by asking if we have any visitors with us today. If we have any visitors, would you mind just raising your hand as a, just a visitor? Any first-time visitors? First-time visitors? Over here, first-time visitors, you're welcome. Welcome to Metro. We have a special gift for you, sir. Thank you. Well, I'd like to take just two minutes, and let's just give everyone around you a warm Metro welcome. So go ahead and just take like a minute or two and just say Happy Sabbath. Amen. It is so wonderful to have you here worshiping with us on this Sabbath day. If you could look in your bulletin with me, there's a couple announcements that I do want to point out for your attention. And that is on February 8th, if you will mark your calendars, please, February 8th at 530. The pastor will be here to go over his Ecuador uh, mission trip. And I'm sure we will all be blessed if uh, you can attend. So mark that in your planner as February 8th at 530. And then this Thursday... At 6 o'clock is the finance committee meeting, and then follow that at 7.15 is a church board meeting. There is also choir potluck today, as well as choir practice, and you are all welcome and encouraged to come sing with us. We would love to have more and more people to join us, so if you are curious about choir, if you think you could sing or can't sing, we would love to have you, so please come and join our choir. The final one I want to point out to you 
and I think this is great by Jeff Baxter. And that is the senior questionnaire. And that is, I think it's here. Do you guys have it in the bulletin? It's the extra sheet, right? And it says, if you're senior citizen, please check a box off what you uh, are need or maybe in need of. And then turn that in. I think it was to like Ginger Bentley or to Jeff Baxter or an offering plate or something. But please take time to look at that. And our deacons are willing to help you with whatever item you may need. So please take a, a moment and fill out that as well. So as we enter into our worship service, I'd like to read to you from our call of worship from Psalms 47, 1 and 2. And it says, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with the voice of the triumph. For the Lord most God is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. Amen. If everybody could get their sheets out in the bulletin, the opening hymn is on that sheet.
It is now time to come to the Lord in prayer. So for those that are able, let's uh, please kneel. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this Sabbath day that you have given us. Uh, thank you for just creating this special day um, for us to relax, um, to refresh our minds from these busy worlds that we live. Um, thank you, Lord, for the blessing of having another day of life and bringing us to church this morning safely. Uh, we ask that you be with each individual here and each families that are represented. Um, please be with us as we are your people. Uh, we ask a special blessing for our pastor and his family as they minister to us in our community around us. And we thank you so much for them. Please, Lord, we ask a special blessing for our church members that are sick and for the members that have recently lost some loved ones. Um, and please be with them and help their hearts and their minds um, to be. Lord, uh, thank you for just giving us uh, your presence here today. We ask that you be with David as he um, preaches to us this morning and shares a special message that is on his heart. Uh, we ask that you help each mind and heart uh, in this sanctuary to be in the right place uh, to hear his message and to allow us to take it into this world um, and be a light for the people that uh, you have asked us to witness to. Uh, we, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Boys and girls, it is now time for your time of the sermon service and our children's story is by Mrs. Adagonis. Is she here today? So as the children come up and down the aisles, they'll be reaching with their hands for any dollar bills or fives and tens, twenties. As uh, that money goes towards our school. <laughs> In the 50s and 100s, as Christopher said. thinking about what lesson, what story can I think about that I could, you know, read to the students, to the children, or something that I could apply to myself too. And I was just thinking about patience and perseverance 
And I was thinking, you know, when I was a child, that I was so hungry and I wanted to get like a peanut butter and I wanted to empty a can. Uh, I don't know if any of you had that experience that you wanted to open one of these and you tried, can you try, let's see if one of these could, one of, let, let's see if you could open that. You want peanut butter and jelly, you want a jar, you want to open some pickles and you want to open it and he said, oh my goodness, this is so hard to open, so let's see. And there's some times that you said, hmm, let me try mom and then mom cannot be able to do it. And you say, well, let me try that. It's hard, right? So it takes patience, right, Sienna? How do you feel when you try to open a can like that? Frustrated? Or? Frustrated. Okay, what about you guys? How do you feel? How do you feel? Strong. Oh, you feel strong? <laughs> you gotta be strong to do stuff like that. So it was very hard for me sometimes. And, and there's some people who try to get a device to get to open it. But anyhow, sometimes it requires a lot of patience and perseverance. So I was thinking, what story in the Bible reminds me of me having patience and perseverance? And, and I thought about one of my favorite stories in the Bible about Joseph. What do you know about Joseph? Remember Joseph in, Joseph in Genesis 37? What do you know about Joseph? What do you remember? Anybody? Any hands? What do you know about Joseph? Let's see. He believed in God. He believed in God. Anybody else? He got sold into slavery. He got sold into slavery. Anybody else? Do you think the brothers were nice? Do you think the brothers were kind to him or mean? Mean. They were mean to him. So why were they mean like that? Because from his dad, he got tons of presents. What kind of, what kind of present did dad give him? Once he got a like new like, like jacket. A new jacket? It was like a robe, right? A, a, a nice coat? It was made of many colors. Oh, okay, so he was mean. Do anybody want to add something to that story? Like, okay, what do you remember about Joseph? Back then when he got his coat, it was harder to have different colors on things. Okay, the coat has many, many different colors. Uh, do you think that he was dad's favorite? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Why, why do you think he was dad's favorite? Um, because he was one of the youngest and um, Rebecca was the one who... It was, he was the oldest of Rebecca's. Okay, so he was one of the youngest? Because he loved Rebecca. Okay, and he got that present. Do you think the brothers wanted a present like that beautiful robe too? What do you think about it? Yes. Yes, so the, so the brothers were jealous. And you know, it's not nice to be jealous because everybody would take turns. Sometimes your brother, your mom or dad might give you a present also. So anyhow, the brothers were so jealous. And do you remember the mean things that the brothers did to Joseph? Anybody remember? Okay, what did they do to him? They threw him in a dry well. Okay, they threw him in the cisterns, right? Yes, what else? He sold, they sold him for silver. Wow, you really know the story. They sold him into slavery. And when he went there, do you remember how many, how many years he was in prison when he was in prison? Two. Wow, you really remember that. Mama and dad, you're doing a very good job with the girls, with the boys and girls. So he suffered so much and then he was so sad when he was in prison and he wanted to get out of there and he was missing the brothers and mom and dad and all of that. But do you know what? Sometimes we got to be patient and we have to persevere. We got to have pers persistence and we need to stick and say, Dad, I, I know that I miss Dad and I know that I'm sad, but who knows? Uh, the Lord might have a plan for me. And he always trusted in God, right? He never lost his faith. And then remember what happened when he was in prison? What about the dreams that the... He told the baker and the um, cup person that cupbearer that that um 
what his dreams meant. Okay, he remembered the dreams and the Pharaoh had a dream and someone told him that he could interpret that dream. And what did he do? What did Joseph do? He told the Pharaoh about the dream. And you re do you remember about the seven cows? Mm -hmm. And there were seven uh, very skinny and seven fat ones. Do you remember the meaning of those? What, what, what did they mean? It meant that there would be seven years of famine and seven years of like a lot of food. Okay, seven days with a lot of food and seven, seven years of a lot of food and seven years with famine. And then, <clears throat> do you think that the Pharaoh trusted Joseph? Yes, he trusted him, and he assigned him to do, uh, he said, okay, I, if, since you interpret my dream, uh, he assigned for him to do something important, and everybody in the community loved Joseph, and they cared for him, and then what happened to, in Canaan, when the mom and dad and the brothers were there, what happened there? The famine there too. Okay, there was famine there and they didn't have enough food. And where were the brothers going to get some food? Where were they going to get some food? They were going to ask whom? Well, who were they going to ask? Joseph. Joseph. And you know what? There was a plan, and Joseph, I know that the story, we could, we could tell so many lessons from the, the story, but it was so good that jo Joseph helped a lot of people in Egypt so they wouldn't have <clears throat> any hungry, and he worked very hard. Did he forgive the brothers after they did all of these bad things to him? Yes. Okay, and what lesson can we get from there? Mm -hmm. We got to be patient and we have to persevere because sometimes God may have plans for us. Did you ever have any challenge in your life uh, that you said, oh, I don't like, this, I don't like that, this experience, but then God had a plan for you? Do you remember? Yes. Oh, you want to say something then about the lesson? Go ahead. That we should never lose our faith. We should never lose our faith because Joseph... God had a plan with Joseph, and he forgave the brothers, and then everybody had food there. So let's, let's ask God so we could have patience and so we could be, have perseverance. And if we say, oh, I want to lose weight or I want to change habits, we got to stick to the plan, and we need to always ask God, especially to have faith. Thank you, boys and girls, for being such a good audience and for your participation. Most of you participated, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. You may go back to your seats and have a happy Sabbath. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. It is always a great day to be in the Lord's house, and we are so blessed to be here in America, to be free to worship how we'd like and as we choose. And we should never take for granted this liberty that so many people in the world don't have. And that's why it's important as individuals and as a church to stand up for religious liberty. Our, our church does this by producing Liberty Magazine, and uh, which is sent to lawmakers and public officials uh, to promote religious freedoms and by advocating for people in employment disputes over religious rights. And you can read more about all that our church does in the insert in your bulletin. Your generous offering today will go toward expanding our work of defending religious freedoms across the North American division. Let's pray for the offering. Dear God, thank you so much uh, for the great freedoms that you give us in this country. Thank you so much that we are free to, to worship you um, as you would have us worship you. Father, please bless this offering uh, and help it go towards uh, continue to promote our religious freedoms. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Our scripture is going to be read today by Jack Connor, not Sean Connor. Jack, you are how old? Twelve. Twelve, and you're in the seventh Seven. grade already. So thank you for filling in and, and reading the scripture today. As you can tell, we did not plan this, though, but we're all wearing gray jackets. Someone pointed that out to me. It was not a requirement up front, but it happened anyway. Today's scripture reading is found in 2 Corinthians 12.9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Just try to clear the narrow street, but the crowd pressed in to see the man condemned to die on Calvary. He was bleeding from a beating. There were stripes upon his back And he wore a crown of thorns upon his head And he bore with every step The scorn of those who cried out for his death Down the Via Dolorosa
down the Via Dolorosa all the way to Calvary. Thank you, that was beautiful. Say uh, it gets easier as you do it. You say third time's the charm, but that's not true. <laughs> uh, as we've done before, let's pray, and uh, please continue to pray for me as I speak. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Please be with me, take a hold of me, Put your words in me. Say, let me say only the words you would have me to speak. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> uh, over the holidays the, this past month, uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to go home, or, or to her home, in Boston. And uh, on the night of Christmas Eve, we all gathered with the extended family, and uh, we shared the news that my wife is expecting and uh, it was uh, just, uh, just screams and shouts, and uh, they're, they're a Puerto Rican family, so it's very loud. Um, her grandma almost blew her eardrum out, and uh, her grandma was just, she went from screaming to shouting to laughing to crying. She went through all the emotions in about 10 seconds. But it was, it was just a night full of joy and laughter. But that night, uh, as we went to sleep, I had a dream. Uh, a strange dream, as some dreams uh, tend to be. And uh, we were, I was in a group, and uh, we were being persecuted. It was the last days, and, and we were all just tired and exhausted and bruised and, and just wanting this whole ordeal to be over. And we all, we all had that common desire, just can, can this be over already? And... Uh, Miss Higgins was actually there, because she's not here today, but she was in the group in my dream. As you, I know, sometimes dreams are strange, but she was there. And uh, somehow, again, dreams are strange, we heard that there was a, a, a bomb was going to be dropped. And, and we all wanted that bomb to be strong enough to reach us, so that, so that it could be over, so that we could go home, so that we could see Jesus. Just then, we see a, a bomb dropping, and we, we see it dropping, and, and it kind of go, was hid behind a hill. And we see this big mushroom cloud appear. And we all rejoiced because we knew that it was strong enough to reach us. And, uh, and as, the, as the, the shock wave hit me, as you know, so the shock wave precedes the actual fireball, as it hit me and I, and I was pushed back, this deep anxiety that I've never felt before hit me. And as the, as the fireball came over me, the last thought in my head was, will I be saved? And I woke up, panicked, couldn't breathe. And I lay there wide awake. I imagine if you had that dream, you would too. But the same thought kept playing in my head, the same question, will I be saved? The dream bothered me. I didn't know how to answer it. How do you answer that question? The dream bothered me for several weeks, and it led me to a man in the Bible, another man who was also bothered and who also had a dream, Jacob. Let's turn our Bibles to Genesis 28. Genesis chapter 28. We'll start at verse 10, and we'll read through verse 15. Genesis 28, we'll start at verse 10 and read through verse 15. <clears throat> now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night. 
because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it as his head, at his head, used it as pillows, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. As we jump into this story, we're at the point where Jacob has just deceived his father. In the verses prior to this, we see a Jacob that has depended on self. He has taken matters into his own hands. He has just taken the birthright through fraud. And so that night he runs away, and on a night where he's feeling hopeless and lost, the Lord gives him a beautiful dream and a beautiful blessing. He sees the ladder going from earth into heaven and all the angels coming back and forth. The Lord promises to make a great nation out of Jacob, and wherever he goes, the Lord will be. I will not leave you, says the Lord. What, what a great promise. Jesus has made that same promise to you and me. Jacob, as we know, wakes up and he spends the next 20 years in exile. And he spends those years getting wronged and defrauded as he went. Year after year in exile, with every wrong, he slowly lost grasp of that promise the Lord had made. He sees how his sins have followed him and how they have given fruit. Just as Satan did with Jacob, he endeavors to force upon you and me a sense of guilt in order to discourage you and break a hold you have on God. The Jacob that takes matters into his own hands and depends on self begins to creep back. Even after God tells him to go back to Canaan, he listens, but once he hears that Esau, his brother, is coming after him to kill him, he goes back and he relies on self. He breaks up his family into two groups, and he starts to send gifts to his brother to try to soften his heart. That night, Jacob sends his family over the brook, and he's left alone. He wanted to be alone to pray. As we know, he's scared, highly distressed. His anxiety is at an all-time high. His brother's coming to kill him. Alone and in the dark, no city lights, not like what we imagine nighttime to be, completely dark, not even airplanes passing by. I imagine it kind of like uh, the time we went camping not too long ago. We took Sonia and Daniel, and it was Sonia's first time camping. And <laughs> so she was just kind of stressed and, and scared because it's your first time in the outdoors. You don't necessarily know or what's going on, or you don't feel safe. And on top of that, uh, Jonathan, I'll blame it on him, uh, convinced her that there was bears and wolves out there. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, no, they're, they're really out there. Look at the signs. And, uh, and as you can imagine, when we woke up, we were all feeling rested. But when we got to Sonia, her eyes were bloodshot, and she stated that she hadn't slept all night for fear that some animal or something was coming to get her. That's kind of what I imagined Jacob like, but times a hundred. Just like that, every blow in the wind, every little noise was analyzed. The thought of his sins and his conscience, his accusing conscience, weighed him down. Just then, he's grabbed, and immediately he starts to fight for his life. He starts to wrestle. Now, I, I don't know if any of you have ever wrestled before, like really wrestled, uh, but whenever I go home to Texas, uh, one thing I always do, despite how old we're getting, is I always wrestle with my brother, Danny. And, 
and we don't just, you know, wrestle and just playing around. We, we really wrestle. We try to make each other faint. And, uh, and if they don't tap out, I mean, every single muscle in our body is tense. And the most we ever last, and this is with breaks in between, is about 20 minutes, and we're just completely exhausted after that. But the Bible says that Jacob starts to wrestle, and he wrestles all night. Superhuman power is on display. Every muscle in his body is tense. By the spirit of prophecy says that not a word is said. So here we can see in full view a Jacob that has taken matters into his own hands and depends on himself. How often are we this Jacob? When troubles assail us, issues at work or home, when worldly stressors batter us down, how often do we depend on our own strength and forget that we have a mighty God on our side? How far has that gotten you? On the flip side of the coin, how often do we say things like, I have all these things, houses, cars, money, all highly combustible, by the way, because of what I did, my own strength, my own merit, my own hard work, and we fail to give credit to the only one that deserves it. How often do we depend on self to fight our own sins? We say, today, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm starting today. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to be a hard worker. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I will do this, and I will do that. And we just make a list of do's and don'ts, things we can check off. But last I checked, there's nothing we can do of our own validity that gets us the crown of heaven. All we do is end up tired. We feel like Christianity is hard. But a real relationship with God is nowhere in sight. Our idea of what a relationship with Jesus is like ends up being a distorted one. And we come to the conclusion that the real reason that we can't answer the question of whether or not you or I will be saved is because we don't know Jesus. There's no real relationship. We have more of a relationship with our social media friends that we hardly even talk to than we do with Jesus. We have lost sight of the promises God has made. That black cloud of sin has obscured our view of Jesus. And we, like Jacob, seek through our own strength to obtain victory. Our sin leads us to believe that, yes, I do see, hear, taste, or touch these things, but I'm not a bad guy not a bad girl. Jesus still loves me. Only he can judge me. Yes, he does love you. And yes, there is going to come a, a day where he will judge you. But like pastor said, don't think that Jesus saves you in your sin. This is not a millennial gospel. Thanks for participating. Here's your prize. Everybody wins. Not how it works. He died to save you from your sin. 1 Peter 3.18 says that Jesus suffered and died for our sins so that he might bring us closer to God, not that we might, may continue to wallow in our sins. Jacob fought and wrestled all night by his own strength with what he perceived to be his enemies or his sin. How long have you been fighting with your sin or your adversary on your own strength? I imagine Jacob there wrestling with the last bit of strength that he had, completely exhausted. And then he just feels a slight, soft touch on his hip. What follows is a sharp pain as he feels his hip pop out of its joint. And in a flash, right then and there, he remembers the promise God had made. The dream he has comes flashing back to him. He sees the ladder going from earth into heaven. He recognizes Jesus as the ladder, the same Jesus that bridges the gap that sin has made between us and God, between him and God. He realizes that he has been fighting the only one that can help him, the only one that can wipe away his sins and give him victory over them. And so he clings on to Jesus for his life. After the whole night of wrestling, when he is at his weakest, he holds on tighter than he ever has. 
This reminds me of the promise God made to us in 2 Corinthians, the verse we just read not too long ago. And he said to me, and he says to you, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When I am weak, when you are weak, he is strong. There he is, disabled and suffering, intolerable pain, but he would not loosen his hold. All mangled and broken, he clung to the angel and he wept and made supplication, pleading for a blessing. He needed to have the assurance that his sin was pardoned. Physical pain was not sufficient to divert his mind from this object. His wealth, his job, his family, those were all secondary things. His determination grew stronger. His faith more earnest and persevering until the very last. It says Jacob was driven almost to despair, but he knew that without the help from heaven, he must perish. He had sincerely repented of his great sin, and he appealed to the mercy of God. He cries and he says, I will not, I cannot let you go until you bless me. He would not be turned away from his purpose. Jacob had completely lost self, and so must we stop looking to self. Look to Jesus, cling to him. Don't loosen your grip. Eternity, your life depends on it. During uh, grade school, I used, to ro- uh, I used to run across country, believe it or not, and uh, we, were, we were the fastest school in the district. And during practice, uh, I always came in first, so, that, so I knew that when this race came about, I knew that I was going to win. I knew that I had this race in the bag as some would say. And so as the race started, I said to myself, you know what, I don't need to try my best. I know I'm going to win. And uh, I'll just hang, you know, a little back here, at least where second or third place is, and then I'll, I'll speed up as the race goes. And as we came to a turn, almost at the three-mile marker with the finish line, about 200 meters away, I was with the second place guy, And just when I was about to say, you know, it's time for me to to take off and win, he had the same idea, uh, except he was faster. (laughs) And he burned me. He left me in, in the dust. And I couldn't compete with him. I had loosened my grip. I got comfortable. And I lost. Don't loosen your grip on Jesus. Don't get comfortable where you are in your life. We should see the evident progress in our life. As you look back a year, two years, five years from now, do we see the progress or are we in the same place? Are we stagnant? Are we satisfied where we are? Are we like soccer players that you see on TV sometimes where they get fouled and they just roll and roll around and they never get up? It seems like they spend more time on their back than they do on their feet. We have to get up. We have to keep moving. There is a heaven before us, a crown of life to win, but to the overcomer only is the reward given. He who gains heaven must be clothed with the robe of righteousness. One of my favorite places uh, in the world to go, I haven't traveled a whole lot, but to the places I have traveled, this is one of my favorite places, uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes, specifically the Big Dune. Uh, I, ha- I just love a good old summer, uh, Michigan summer sunset on top of that bluff. Uh, my wife and I try to go every summer uh, since we moved here. But as you're down there, as you get to the bottom and you look up, you say, what did I do? <laughs> because you can't even see the top. The top can't be seen. And as you start climbing, you quickly realize that, you, that you're going to need more than just your feet. You're going to need everything, your hands, anything you have. And with every step, you come down half a step. And it quickly becomes a very daunting task. As exhaustion sets in, you can sit back and take in the view. 
And when you sit back and take in the view, you, you kind of look down and you, and you say, well, look at all that I've progressed. I like the view from here, you know? And the same thoughts ha- keep occurring every time you stop. But the top has not been reached. You have to keep going. If you're like my mom, you'll climb two-thirds of the way up there and you'll say, nope, I'm done. Uh, this is it. I'm not climbing anymore. Call the helicopter. <laughs> but, but we have to keep climbing. We have to continue to, the, to progress because the best view is at the top. The goal is heaven and we must continue to progress and cling to God to give us the, pl- the power to climb to the top. Spirit of Prophecy says, Let everyone start at the lowest round and mount step by step, climbing up by Christ, clinging to Christ, ascending to the height of Christ. This is the only way to advance heavenward. Let nothing turn the attention away from the great work that is to be done. We should move steadily forward, never losing heart or hope in the good work. Whatever trials beset our path, whatever moral darkness encompasses us, patience, faith, and love for duty are the lessons we must learn. Subduing self and looking to Jesus is an everyday work. What are you wrestling with? Cling to God. Do not be discouraged. God has a plan for you. He has better plans than you have for yourself. It is only through self-surrender and clinging to God that we know the plans God has for us. Allow him to enter, to use you to do great things in your life. The only safety for us is in clinging to Jesus and letting nothing separate the soul from the mighty helper. For us to say like Jacob, I will not and I cannot let you go till you bless me. There uh, There was a man and uh he was at home, and he heard a knock at the door. And today, if you hear a knock at the door, you say, well, who's knocking at my door? You know, nobody called me or texted me, warning me that someone was coming over. But as he opens the door, uh, he sees Jesus to his surprise. And uh, Jesus says, uh, can I come in? And the man says, yes, of course. Come, come in, come, come sit here in, in the sofa in the living room. And as Jesus is walking in, he's kind of shuffling, getting trying to clean things up because the house was a little messy. And Jesus sits and they talk for about an hour. And uh, as the conversation comes to a close, Jesus says, do you think it'd be okay if I come back tomorrow? And the man says, yes, I would would love nothing more than that. And so he says, okay, I'll, I'll be here tomorrow. And so the next day, the man is waiting. He even, you know, cooks some dinner for him. And Jesus knocks at the door, and they spend a couple hours together. And at the end of that conversation, Jesus asks again, do you think it'd be okay if I come back tomorrow? He says, yes, come back. And so the same process plays out for about a week or two. And then one day, they're they're just talking, and it gets late. And uh, the man says, you know what? It's late, Jesus. You you shouldn't leave. It's snowing outside. The the roads are are not good. You should should stay and sleep here. Jesus says, are you sure? I don't don't want to be a bother. He says, no, you wouldn't be a bother. Are you kidding me? And so he stays and sleeps. And in the morning, as he's leaving, he says, you know, I I, got to go, but I'll be back back this, this evening. He says, yes, I'm ready. And that evening, as Jesus is, is coming up to knock on the door, the man comes outside and meets him outside. And Jesus says, do you think it'd be okay if we go for a walk today? And the man says, yeah, I like walking. And uh, so they start walking. And uh, they walk for a couple hours, and then he goes home. And the, pro- the same process that they had done before is followed with walking. And one night, one evening, they walk and the man looks at his watch and he says, you know what, I, I need to turn around because if I don't turn around now, it's going to get too dark, it's going to get too late, and, and I don't, I don't want to be out that late. And Jesus says, okay, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. And so he comes and he knocks on the door and they start walking the next day again. And as they're walking, they're talking, they're sharing stories, they're laughing. He's sharing everything that he has, all the intimate details. And they're walking and the man loses track of time and then he looks he looks and he sees that it's night 
And he has no idea where he's at even. And he says, I can't believe this, Lord. I don't even know where we're at. I don't even know how to get back home from here. And uh, Jesus says, you know what? It, it's okay. I, we're, I, we're actually closer to my house. You can come spend the night. I spent the night with you. You can, you know, you've, I, it's only fair for me to, to come to return the favor. But so why don't you spend the night with me? And the man says, are, are you sure? I don't, I don't want to be a bother. I don't want to, you know. And Jesus said, are you kidding me? I would love nothing more. And the man says, okay, let's, let's do it. And they start walking. And that man was never seen again. The story is the same as Enoch with just a modern approach. But you can have that same walk with Jesus every day. Get to know God. Walk with him. Talk with him. Let him know what you're going through at work or at home. Maybe you're struggling with a certain sin that you can't shake off, or you're having a hard time with the loss of a loved one. Maybe you're brokenhearted. Whatever it is, let him know. He is the best listener. He also gives the best advice, counsel, and comfort. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. Obtain victory over self through prayer. Jesus needs men and women who by wrestling alone with God obtain the victory over self and then go forth to impart to others that, with the, that which they have received from the source of power. Jesus is knocking. Won't you let him in? Open the door. Christ will come in and dwell with you if you will open the door of your hearts to him. There may be perfect harmony between you and the Father and his Son if you die to self and live unto God. Our Savior is the ladder which Jacob saw, whose base rested on earth and whose topmost rounds reached the highest heaven. This shows the anointed method of salvation. If any of us are finally saved, it will be by clinging to Jesus as to the rounds of a ladder. As Jacob wrestled with God, that same Jacob that depended on self and took matters into his own hands was fully surrendered. He had known the truth before. One could say he was a good Adventist, but he didn't experience a true conversion until that night of wrestling when he was fully surrendered. Jacob held fast to Jesus and urged his petition with earnest, agonizing cries until he prevailed. Jacob, the Bible says, had power over the angel and prevailed. Through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. Can you imagine that? Wrestling with Jesus and winning? How? How is that possible? He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God, and the heart of the infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. Jacob overcame. The books in heaven can say the same thing about you. Mr. George Mahalski wrestled with Jesus and prevailed. Miss Modiga wrestled with Jesus and prevailed. Miss Stacy Francois wrestled with Jesus and prevailed. Same thing can be said about you. Jack wrestled with Jesus and prevailed. You see, when you wrestle with self, we get nowhere. But when we wrestle with Jesus, Amen. victory is sure. Jesus will never turn from you. Cling to him. As a sign of his forgiveness and his triumph, Jesus gave Jacob a new name. One day, not too far from now, when we get to heaven, just like Jacob, we will receive a new name. This one will be on a white rock, symbolizing that with the help of Jesus, we have gained victory over sin. <laughs> For eternity. 
the overcomers will have the privilege of being able to spend eternity with Jesus. The Lord will never forsake the soul that trusts him and seeks his aid. Jesus is with you now and forever. Cling to him as Jacob did. Victory is sure. The crown of life is placed only upon the brow of the overcomer. Thank you.
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you weak, dirty, and humbled. We need you, Lord. You are the source of life. Help us to cling to you. Give us the strength to not loosen our hold on you. Be with us now and forever. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.